Fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam, please climb that tree. <laughs> so imagine for a moment you're that fish. You turn around and you stare at that tree. Think about how that's going to make you feel over your entire educational career. That's the shame, the lack of, the feeling of a, like you'll never succeed. That's exactly what happened to me. I ended up becoming depressed, started falling apart. Eventually a teacher made a suggestion that maybe I should get tested for learning disabilities. The diagnosis was dyslexia. What does that even mean? It was too late. I had a 0.0, .0 GPA, and I dropped out. I was told I needed to go to summer school. I knew I wasn't going to be able to graduate with my peers in the year 2000, so I got on a plane and flew down to visit my grandfather. He was a professor at Caltech. It was 1999. The Human Genome Project was in full swing, and he gave up his lab and wanted to start studying the DNA as it was coming out of the Human Genome Project. I showed up and I had a bunch of computer skills that he thought would be able to help him. So it became an apprenticeship or a form of just-in-time learning where I got daily lectures in biology. And then I used that knowledge to start throwing together computer programs and trying to solve the problems for him. It accelerated his research significantly. A month later, in August of 1999, Thomas West showed up. My grandfather had read his book and recognized himself in it and asked, called him up and asked him to stop by. This, this, <sighs> this, this day changed my life. It was a moment that it's a moment that changed my life. Tom and came and showed this video, Dyslexia and Unwrapped Gift. And I started seeing that all of the struggles I had during high school suddenly started making sense, and that there was this extreme visual spatial strength that I had. Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you. So everything started making sense that day. My world got flipped upside down and became more clear at the same time. I recognized why I could accomplish some of the things that didn't seem to make sense with the grades that I was getting the visual spatial thinking. I also saw that my grandfather had overcome this. He almost didn't get through the education system himself but, himself, but someone believed in him. He went on to build the first automated protein sequencer, like you see on the left. In 1965, with his colleague Claude Bennett, he ended up proposing a hypothesis about how antibodies formed from genes to protein. Tonagawa in the 1970s did an experiment that proved his hypothesis was correct and later got the Nobel Prize for it. I learned that day that dyslexia was a gift, not something to be ashamed of. It planted the seed that maybe I didn't have to feel so bad about myself, that there was hope in the future. For the rest of that summer, I got to work on data from the Human Genome Project with my grandfather, starting fresh. Now, here's just one example of the inspiration I had at the time, the Nature paper about the human genome. I'd already been working on it for two years by the time this came out. Summer came to an end, and the question of what I was going to do next came up. My grandfather suggested that I go to Pasadena City College and tell them I dropped out, I'm not going back, and I want to continue my education. I thought this was a crazy idea, and there was no way they would let me in. 
he told me, he said, what's the worst that's going to happen? You'll be right where you are now. It's one of the greatest lessons I ever learned. Of course he was right. I got in. I ran over to disabled student programs and was told I needed to do extensive testing over 18 hours over a few months. The results came back showing extreme strengths and extreme weaknesses in the top percentile and the bottom percentile. Of course, with the way the education system works, that if you take a while taking one or two classes per semester and you come to transfer, you have to take the tests all over again. Similar results. The one taking, the person who tested me originally took an interest in me and pointed out that with the rapid picture naming and the IQ test, I scored as almost retarded, 73. But on the other end of the spectrum, in a test called planning, I completely finished the exam and could have kept on going. I got the highest possible score for that test. I also apparently scored very high in concept formation. One of my challenges here for the community is I don't even know what all of these test results imply. What the rapid picture naming... <laughs> <laughs> I would really like to understand this, and I think children and ev people in this room would love to figure out what this means. I also want to point out that I was the last student at Pasadena City College to get tested for free. They stopped offering testing. UC Berkeley doesn't offer testing. From my understanding, this can cost somewhere between $700 and $2,800 to have it done privately. Another challenge, how do we make this affordable and accessible to everyone? Meanwhile, I went over to Caltech to a bioinformatics lab and convinced them to give me a six-month trial. I ended up getting to work there and working with the JPL machine learning group. One of the first things I got to do was work on the, G the GeneX project. It was I needed to load gene expression data into a database. I rapidly got sent over to the uh, consortium that was working on it in the University of Virginia. They asked me to speak at their conference. Here I am, a high school dropout, feeling like crap and feeling like an imposter at this prestigious university. I get there, I get up on stage and recognize there's over 18 professors in the audience and all their grad students and postdocs. And having this fear that someone was going to stand up and tell me, sit down, we know all of this already. This is pointless. I start giving the talk anyways. It's going along and then somebody stood up. Everything froze in that moment. I felt that fear was becoming a reality. He said, you do realize you're the only person in the world who's ever gotten that software to work. And they were the ones who wrote the software. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had many other stories like this at Caltech, just to go through one or two really quickly. A grad student had his paper rejected. I recognized that the, the reviewer didn't recognize the true potential of what he was accomplishing. So I wrote some software to wrap his plots and wrote a tutorial. That reviewer ended up citing my tutorial and software is the reason why he changed his mind on that paper. That's where I got my first, uh, my name on my first publication. Not as the primary author, but high school dropout with the publication from Caltech. <laughs> <laughs> and remember this Nature publication about the human genome? I didn't realize that in 2012, Another paper would come out, on the ENCODE project, a guide to the human genome. Because of work I did at Caltech, my name is included on that list of authors. Yeah. What this
taught me was that having my grandfather who believed in me before I could believe in myself was the biggest difference in my life. And having Thomas West show the, point, the positive sides of dyslexia made all the difference. So mentorship is one of the challenges I have for you guys. I decided I wanted to finish my education, so I transferred to UC Berkeley. I got a scholarship that covered all of tuition and then some. I was inspired by that JPL machine learning group that I was working with and wanted to go to Berkeley for the combination of their machine learning as well as the disabled student programs there was the first in the world. I learned there that there's an that my 100 words per minute reading rate didn't have to stop me from succeeding in reading the books in the classes. They had a program to be able to digitize books, and I could use a screen reader that it turns out with a little practice, I was able to get up to three, between 300 and 500 words per minute with reading. Unfortunately, the program had problems with trying to get the books digitized in time and started pushing back on the students. So we we're going to suddenly have to wait for weeks to get access to the books. I then sat down with Tabitha, one of my friends there, and we're talking about how we're at a research university trying to, being expected to go do research in the library and recognizing that while we've never, or while we always go to the library, we never check out books. The only thing I've ever gotten from a library was a late fee. <laughs> um, it turns out they wouldn't digitize the books. I ended up getting involved with, or we ended up getting involved with a group, the Disability Rights Advocates, to try to change that. Um, in May 7th, 2013, the, um, UC Berkeley s signed a settlement that now any student in DSP can get their library books digitized. You know, this was another turning point for me, recognizing what else are we not seeing, and there's so much more I want to talk about about what I discovered at Berkeley and have no time to, to say. Um, you know, the value of being able to go to a library and pick out a book and actually read it for the first time was something that I was taking for granted my whole life. I also recognized that I was having trouble getting help from DSP because I knew more about my own disability or strength than they did. Uh, just as a fun side note, I graduated last May from UC Berkeley with honors and distinction. <laughs> but then the, the question comes of what next? I realized I had so many ideas I wanted to start many businesses I needed to start somewhere. I needed funds, so I decided I'd just I'd go out and get a job. I interviewed with over 12 companies and had went through 48 interviews for software engineering. The problem with software engineering interviews is that typically they'll have a software engineer come in, they'll look at your resume for five minutes, ask you two or three questions, and then say, "Okay, enough of that. Let's get to it. let's get to the the data structures problem." The problem with that is this is exactly the type of problem that I would get extended time on tests for. And what message does it send to that software engineer that if I tell them I need 1.5 times longer to solve this particular problem? The question becomes, do I tell the potential employer that I'm dyslexic or not? Um, and You know, I know that my strengths and my successes at Caltech and other places have allowed me to accomplish things that my employers extremely appreciate, but I don't get to say that in the software engineering test. I didn't get any of those jobs. So. 
another challenge. How do you disclose the, the dyslexia? Do you? I don't know yet. At Berkeley, I recognized that I had the ability to change the world and see things that many others couldn't see, as many of you already appreciate. You know, asking the right questions, finding the problems. I, I have many of these. I have solutions to a couple of them. I just don't have the time or money to implement them. You know, like the delay between scientific understanding and um, common public knowledge. Or having brilliant solutions to, pro to policy, like communicating from the CDC to the government. I've got ideas for solutions to all of those. I think we're all here for this one. So the next part of my journey is starting a business. I got a group of people together and we created something we now call Symbius. Why? Because com consumers speak and companies like Netflix ignore and listen, or don't listen and decide that it's a great idea to split away the DVD side of the business and lose millions of customers as a result. So using natural language processing and understanding of consumers and empowering their voices is what I want to do. So I pulled together this, this team and they're helping me put this together. We're building a prototype currently. I'm grateful to be here. It's great to see all these dyslexics. I've never had this many brilliant people in the room who think like me. Thank you.